I'm really looking forward to this conversation because the learning curve for me is enormously steep. Uh, so, and, and you'll be able to tell that. Um, so Jonathan, I'm going to start by asking you, because in your book you say, by the way, this book can be read by somebody like me. It's a wonderful book. Uh, it's clear. It's filled with wonderful examples. Um, I'm a lot smarter having read it. Um, but you, know, you write that the investments in what you refer to as intangible assets are now outpacing the investments by companies in tangible assets. So first, define those intangibles. What are they investing in? The sort of traditional forms of investment that uh, companies do and that you know, we count when we compile the GDP numbers are typically tangible things. So buildings, vehicles, plant equipment, computers. Uh, but the core of our book, as you say, Jane, is that what companies are doing now is they're investing in things which you can't touch and feel in the way that you can do with buildings and plant and equipment and all that kind of thing. So what, what kind of things are they? So those are things like R&D, mm -hmm. uh, things like, since we're in California, software, big data, things like that. Uh, things like designs, uh, very important in the fashion industry and so forth as well. Uh, and then quite a few other aspects kind of around, you know, improving the business processes within a firm, you know, what it is that makes Walmart somehow feel different to Kmart. You know, they both sell shoes, but somehow or other these feel like different corporations. So the, the business process within the firm is important as well. And the training and the marketing and the branding and so forth as well. Well, so Stian, the, the fact that Jonathan pointed to Walmart makes me want to ask this question because when people refer to the, these kinds of intangibles, um, I, I think of companies like Google, like Amazon, like Uber, tech-based companies. What do these companies look like that are, that are making these investments in intangibles? So you're absolutely right that when people think of the new economy, it's tech that's front and center. But if we're thinking about who is investing in intangible assets, it goes much wider than the tech sector. And one example we talk about in the book is the example of gyms. It's kind of the most physical business you can imagine. It's about weights that you lift and so forth. Um, but if you go to a modern day gym, you'll find that gym, as well as having lots of physical assets like machines and a building, they'll also have lots of intangible assets. A lot of gyms are branded, they'll have software that runs themselves, and they'll have a fairly advanced marketing um, system designed to get people to join up and ideally come as little as possible. But also, if you look at a lot of gyms, um, they will have within them other businesses that are completely intangible. If any of you have done a high-intensity interval training class like Body Pump, those classes are run by a little business in New Zealand called Les Mills International that records the music, owns the music rights, designs the training routines, sends them out to trained instructors who train on Les Mills training programs. That business, apart from a recording studio somewhere in New Zealand, has basically no tangible assets at all, but really valuable intangible assets. So it's kind of a ghost in the machine that's entirely intangible, even in this most tangible of industries. And of course, they're grocery stores. I just remember this because of in 1992, which is about the time when you said that these investments did shift, when investments in intangible assets started to overtake uh, investments in intangible ones. But I'm sure you remember when George Herbert Walker Bush was running against Bill Clinton and he discovered the barcode code in the grocery store. And it made people think he was out of touch because those of us who shop for our groceries knew about a barcode. But vice presidents and presidents <laughs> don't shop <laughs> at Safeway, apparently. But, but it is, I mean, it, 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 it's embedded also, aren't these sort of intangible assets sometimes embedded, embedded in the means of production as well? Uh, well, I mean, the barcode is an example of that in a sense. It's been, you know, since the 1950s, really, you know, the, the barcodes have been rolled out in various yeah, supermarkets yeah. and they've revolutionized all the aspects of supermarkets. And I think, you know, part of what the book tries to do is it tries to describe, as Stian has just said about gyms, the kind of bundle of intangible assets yeah. that yeah. often come around a technology invention like the barcode. So, so once the data, for example, comes along, which yep. the barcode you know delivers you know fantastic information on the data, then you have an, an intangible asset, namely the data. You have another intangible asset, the software to process the data and so yeah. on. I'm, I'm thinking about sort of old economy. Uh, 
businesses like the automob automobile business and the degree to which um, uh, R&D is an important input there, and various technologies, et cetera, and to the way yeah. we go about... Uh, oh, and, and, and uh, design. Yeah. And I believe it's the case that the software in a car now is more valuable you know, than the, the old-fashioned iron and steel and you yeah, know, aluminium yeah. and so forth that's in the yeah, car as well. Yeah. So, so what does this mean for productivity, Stan? Um, we, we keep hearing that productivity has gone way up in this country through the 90s and, and beyond. Um, what, is, what is the role of these intangible investments in, in the product, productivity of all kinds of companies? So intangible investment is really important for productivity, um, partly because like any investment, it makes the company that invests in it more productive. But intangible assets tend to have another role in productivity as well, which is that the benefits of these investments often spill over beyond the company that makes them. Mm -hmm. So to give an example, if we think of the design that went into the Apple iPhone, one of the most profitable products in the history of capitalism, um, if you'll recall, when the first iPhone came out in 2007, it was revolutionary. Smartphones before then were kind of these sort of weird products that were not necessarily very usable. The form factor, the design of the iPhone, aside from the technology, was kind of absolutely memorable. That was a kind of really valuable, intangible investment that Apple had made through Johnny Ever, designer, and so forth. But of course, if you'll remember what then happened, within about 18 months, every smartphone looked basically like an iPhone. So that investment benefited not just the productivity of Apple as a firm and the profits of Apple's stockholders, but also it benefited the industry as a whole. And I guess what that means is if you want to see productivity growth in the economy, then investment in intangibles is very important. Has, I think you quoted a book by Peter Thiel in your book who argued that because of that spillover effect, it's it's extremely important, A, to make the right investments, but B, to get a monopoly position if possible. What was his argument? So the thing that he highlights is this challenge that is created by the spillovers, because obviously no company will want to make an investment if they're worried that the benefit is going to accrue to their competitors. So what that means is it creates a big incentive if you're coming up with, if you're investing in an innovation, if you're investing in intangible assets, to invest in as many intangibles as possible that combine with one another to create a bit of a defensive moat. So if we think back to the iPhone, the iPhone wasn't just good design, there was also software investment in the operating system, there was business development investment in developing the app store and the relationship with suppliers, and of course the thing that Tim Cook pioneered, the kind of the incredible supply chain that was the thing that kind of let Nokia down, their big competitor. Mm -hmm. um, and you may not be able to protect an idea or a brand, or any of these individual intangibles. But if you can bring together a bundle of them and make the most of these synergies, then that can be more defensible. And that is the kind of these one source of these monopolies that Peter Thiel encourages businesses yeah, to develop. Yeah. Jonathan, in the book, when you talk about, when you both talk about the various characteristics of these investments, spillover is one of them, synergies, is is another scalability is another talk about actually more about about synergies so we can picture it but um but also the importance of, of the ability I mean, obviously you can scale an idea so what how does that work yeah so the scaling of an idea is just as you say uh we talk about the taxi cab industry and if you think of if if you'll forgive us for a second us recalling london taxi cabs as those of you who've been to london will know classic london taxi cabs you can fit five people into in, into them but if you want to get another person you've got to get another taxi cab so if you're running a taxi cab company you've got to order some more tangible assets on the other hand, the miracle of Uber is that, uh, you know, we can use it in London to get to the airport and then we can, you know, step out of San Francisco airport and then use it here as well. In other words, the same thing can be scaled up. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the features of intangible assets, which is kind of interesting. And of course, it's very important for when many businesses work out a business process which means they can run supply chains well and they can you know, generally get the business running well. They can often scale that across their many, you know, across countries, for example, or many of the different, if it's a shop, you know, if it's a store, many of the different stores in the business as well. Mm -hmm. So that's on the scalability side. Um, but we should say something about synergies as well. Yes. Uh, uh, well, we talk in, in the book about the EpiPen uh, as an example of synergies. And... Um, 
I, I know there's been a lot of controversy around the EpiPen, but if you sort of think about what the EpiPen is, it is... Uh, you, 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 I should explain the EpiPen, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, you know, stops people from getting an anaphylactic shock. So, I mean, a fantastic invention and all of that has saved many lives. And so the first thing you might think of is you might think, well, yeah, OK, I get that. That's an intangible asset because it's the design of the chemical. It's the, you, you know, it's the molecules and all of that that they've done. And we know about all of that. That's all protected by patents and so forth. So it's not a big surprise that the EpiPen would be a big success. Well, actually, it turns out that the patents expired in the 1920s. Mm. So those patents have all, you know, they've all gone now. But what the EpiPen is, sorry, going back to the issue of synergies, is it's a bundle of different intangible assets. So it's not only the R&D, but it's also the design of the EpiPen itself. It's the marketing and the branding, which has made it so popular, and the training that people get in operating it. So we think that the, the idea of synergies is when you bundle these intangible assets together, you get a particularly valuable product. Mm -hmm. Another, I'm trying to remember, because you each of the characteristics began with an S. So, right. so Stian, there was sunk costs. Sunk costs. Um, it, why is it that intangible as assets are viewed as uh, investments are viewed as sunk co costs, and should that should that worry anyone? Well, so if we compare here tangibles and intangibles, um, I mentioned earlier Nokia, the mobile phone company that uh, that was kind of humbled by, by Apple and other competitors. Um, when Nokia got into trouble, um, they had a bunch of assets which they, they sold off. One of these assets, one of these very important assets, was a tangible asset, their huge building in Helsinki in Finland. Uh, that's a tangible asset. They sold it for a vast amount of money, and it's now full of all sorts of Finnish startups. Um, Nokia's stockholders got quite a lot of that money back. Um, they also had some valuable intangible assets. They had the operating system for, um, for, 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 for the Nokia mobile phone, Symbian. Um, and that was worth far less. It eventually became Windows Mobile. But the, 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 the proceeds and what Nokia got back when they wanted to get out of that business was far, far less. So this idea of sunkenness is that, on the whole, intangible assets, if the business should fail, or if you kind of want to divest some of these intangible assets, they're often worth much less to someone else than a tangible asset is. And that causes concern for a number of reasons. And the primary one is that a huge part of our financial system, our business finance system, is geared around bank lending or bondholder lending. And if you lend money, if you, if you, if you provide debt finance, you want to get something back in case, the, in case your debtor defaults. And if all that person has are intangible assets, which are worth much less than tangible assets, then you have a problem. As a banker, you're less willing to lend. So we face this question of, is our financial system well geared towards supporting a real economy that's got a lot of intangible assets in it? And the answer sounds like no? I think the answer is, that, that to some extent, no. Um, I think you would expect, if you wanted a financial system really well geared towards intangible assets, you'd want to see a lot more equity than debt, so a lot more stockholding one way or another. And, you know, we're in, we're in San Francisco, where there is a lot of venture capital, but in global scale, that's a very niche activity. Mm -hmm. For the most part, most businesses that rely on external finance rely on bank debt or rely on other lending. And we, for the most part, don't have the institutions to do that. Our tax laws strongly favor debt. So we kind of have a set of institutions that were very geared towards the world maybe 50 years ago from a financial point of view. Mm -hmm. but, but, but maybe they're not so geared for, for, for the economy we have now. Yeah. I mean, I just wonder, Jen, if we could just dwell on that for a second, because Stian and I, as you can probably tell from our accent, are from London. So we've got a huge financial centre in London. Uh, yet we come to San Francisco, there's all this venture capital going on as well. In a sense, I think it shows very clearly the distinction between tangible and intangible assets. Mm -hmm. That here in San Francisco, you seem to have a big venture capital group geared up precisely to lend to firms who are starting up on intangible yeah. assets like software and so on. Back in London, we have fantastic buildings and a huge city of London and this and the other. Most of the lending is against, of course, property, mm. which, as Stian was just saying, is one of those assets which is not sunk. Uh, and banks find it very easy to enter. And I think there's a real dilemma, even for highly developed banking systems like the British banking system, you know, epitomized by the city of London. Mm -hmm. There's a big dilemma about whether those financial institutions are suitable in an intangible economy. Yeah. Mm. Tell me about valuations, because this is something I find 
utterly baffling. Um, you know, you, you've got a company, Stian, that has no revenues, um, is, uh, you know, is an idea that sounds cool, but, you, and it, it doesn't have tangible assets that you can, you can, you know, touch and feel, and yet they're valued at extraordinary high rate. How, how is that done? How is that thought about? And do we get in situations where we get awful bubbles? So valuation definitely becomes harder in an intangible economy. Um, there's some, been some really interesting work done by accounting scholars, um, a guy called Baruch Lev, who looked at how informative a company's financial statements are about the market value of the stock, the value of the stock in the company. And he looked over time. And it turns out that if you look at, say, companies formed in the 1950s, the balance sheet and the financial statements, the assets, are actually pretty informative. They tell you a lot about the market value of the company because these companies rely on you know, buildings or mines or plant machinery or vehicles. Um, if you look at companies that are founded in the last decade, um, not informative at all. And again, when we see the questions that equity analysts for banks ask management, those questions are all about intangible assets and what the, what intangible assets the company has and what, 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 the value, what the value is. But as you say, there is this kind of phenomenon where we have companies that suddenly seem to be worth a vast amount of money. And again, we talked about this idea that intangibles are very scalable. If, you've, if you hit on the right intangible, the right business model behind it, you can go from something that's not worth very much to something that's worth a lot in pretty short order. So the amount of uncertainty and the kind of inscrutability mm -hmm. of valuation, I think, does increase, which, which you know, you, you would expect to see potentially more bubbles forming in yeah. that kind of economy. Uh, but it, it, it feels very good to stockholders right now. I mean, our, our uh, stock market is, as Donald Trump pointed out during the State of the Union address, it's soaring. Um, so as you look at this economy, who benefits? So we're seeing one of the one of the interesting phenomena we see in the economy at the moment, and intangibles plays a role, is that in sector after sector and in country after country, we see a small number of businesses that are doing really, really well. And then a kind of long tail of businesses that are less productive, less profitable. And that gap has been pretty rigorously shown to be have been expanding in the last mm -hmm. 20 years. So the leaders are pulling ahead, the laggards are lagging ever more. Um, and economists, policymakers have puzzled about this for the last few years since this data has become really clear. Um, and we think that intangibles play a big role in it. Because as we've said, if you're a business like Uber, with some really valuable intangibles. Those intangibles go really well together, the algorithm, the brand, the network of partner drivers and so forth. And they're often very scalable. You can use the algorithm and you can expand to London or to Vienna or to whatever your next city is. So that means if you're a firm that has some of these intangibles, you're likely to pull ahead. If you're, say, in that market, a local taxi firm, not only do you lack the scale but the incentive, even the incentive for you to invest is relatively limited because what good is an algorithm will be much less valuable for you than, than, than for others. So I think that comes back to this question of stock market valuations. You know, publicly traded companies are typically the biggest companies. And you can imagine a stock, a, a stock market where you have a few quoted companies doing incredibly well, driving up the headline indices, and a bunch of other companies that aren't even publicly traded, that are much smaller companies, that are stuck in this kind of low productivity, low profitability morass. So the headline stock indicators might be telling you less about the average company than perhaps they used to. Yeah, yeah, because it feels very much like a winner-take-all economy Absolutely. in many ways. You mentioned investment. Um, it's something else I find baffling. It's a time where there are extraordinary profits, really wonderful profits. Um, things are going very well for companies. Why aren't they investing more? Why aren't they thinking more long term? And how does, um, well, first place, are we measuring their, their investments in intangible assets? But also, what's, what's driving uh, a question, the question of whether to invest or not invest, and how does this spillover effect play into that? Well, so, so, so let me say what it is, because I'm an economics professor, I'm interested in these very arcane details of measurements, but let me try to convince people in the audience that they're actually <laughs> extremely interesting. I mean, basically, as Steen was saying before, 
because this intangible investment is very hard to measure, uh, and the company accounts have just become very uninformative about this, and the community of accountants, you know, who spend a lot of time wrestling with these types of issues, have essentially decided that this just this stuff is just too hard to measure, and so most of it is just left out of the accounts altogether. So when we look to the company accounts and ask the question, where is the investment? We just can't see it. Mm. Now, the other source to look is around GDP. They're not company accountants. They're called national income accountants. Uh, what they do is they do a bit more counting, actually. They've moved a little bit. So, for example, they count the amount of spending on software, count the amount of spending on uh, R&D. And most recently in the United States, they count the spend, amount of spending on artistic originals, m movies and books and films and all that kind of thing, which are all intangible assets. However, they're not counting design. They're not counting business processes. They're not counting branding. They're not counting big data, actually, either mm -hmm. as well. Very topical, uh, you know, in, 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 this, in this area. So there's a whole sort of gamut of intangible assets which they're not counting. So we can't see it in the company accounts, we can't see much of it either in the national accounts. Mm -hmm. And that's why investment, as part of the reason why investment seems to be very low. Uh, and the part of the sto our story in the book is that actually it's a bit higher than you would think. Mm -hmm. So we have all just joined a community of accountants and in our understanding of this. So thank you. <laughs> the, uh, but Stian, you, you did refer to when you were talking about the spillover effects is kind of, you know, why make that investment if other, if, if particularly if my competitor is going to be the beneficiary, but basically if the benefits will accrue uh, much more broadly, why should you shoulder the full burden of the investment? Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely right. And um, for us, this does help provide an answer to one of the big puzzles that economists and policymakers are wrestling with, this so-called question of secular stagnation. Mm. Um, for the non-economists, the kind of you could describe secular stagnation as why a company, why is productivity low, why is business investment low at a time when interest rates are low, so money is cheap, you know, companies should be willing to invest when money is cheap. Um, and the paradox is that all of that is happening together at a time when the recorded corporate profits are pretty high. So it's kind of a head scratcher for economists. Those things shouldn't be happening at once. And I think our argument for part of the reason for that is the role that intangibles play. And as you said, um, if you have a market where the intangible investments are a really good prospect for a few leading firms, they will make the investments, they'll get a high ROI and the, the overall level of corporate profits will look pretty healthy. But the vast majority of firms will have very little incentive to do it because they don't get these benefits as synergies, they don't have the, be the, 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 the business to scale over. Um, and consequently, the kind of the average level of actually investment could potentially be quite low. So that would that is one potential way of explaining this issue. And we certainly find that this 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 issue of, of dispersed investment seems to happen more in industries that are pretty that are more intangible intensive. And there's of course investment in human capital, in training, for example. If we're all going to have multiple not only multiple jobs in our in our careers, but multiple careers, there's a spillover effect of that. Another industry, another company is going to benefit from that training. Is that is that depressing that kind of investment? Um, I, I mean, I think it, I think it is. And unlike things like R and D and artistic originals, it's pretty difficult to copyright that sort of stuff. It's you know it's pretty difficult to put a you know give the firm uh, who's making the investment some property rights over all of that. So um, that's quite hard uh, the training issue, and th that's why I think many economists, policymakers think that training is typically going to be underprovided. And there's an important area, you know, where policymakers might want to step in. That's, that's where the public sector should step in. Mm. Um, because you're Brits, I, I do have to ask you about the, the, the Beatles example you <laughs> gave. You know. um, so, Stephen, I'm going to throw that one to you because it's an example of a company that ran into the spillover effect. But yes. tell me about the music company. I will. So... Um, the Beatles record label, the company that owned the Beatles record label in the 1960s, was a company called EMI, who were kind of now known as a record label first and foremost. Back in the 1960s, though, they weren't just a record label. They were, their full name was Electrical and Mechanical Industries, and they made everything from kettles to guided missiles to Beatles LPs. They were a kind of classic 1960s conglomerate. 
Um, they were extremely cash rich because the Beatles made so much money, not least from touring in the United States, and it allowed them to fund all sorts of interesting products. And one of the products they found that they funded was this pro pro uh, project by a crazy computer guy who decided that he could come up with a way of seeing inside the soft tissues of the human body. And the thing that he invented was something that's now known to us as the CT scanner revolutionized cancer therapy, neurology, all aspects of medicine, a really major medical breakthrough. But they funded him to develop this. He won a Nobel Prize. The Queen knighted him, and he became a fellow of the Royal Society. He was kind of heaped with honors. But EMI stockholders made zero from this invention because it was almost immediately more effectively commercialized by General Electric here in the US and by Siemens in Germany. Um, so all these intangible investments that were made in R&D, in software design, I used to work with a guy who designed the software for the early CT scanners, uh, the marketing, they hired a big US medical sales team and built that business to sell it. All of that went for naught. Um, because they failed to, 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 to win that kind of competitive race. And this, for us, is a great example of the problem of spillovers. Um, the really interesting riff on that is, you know, in the 1960s, companies were kind of quite loosely governed. The kind of the, 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 the stockholder control over management was perhaps quite light. So if you did have a kind of great scientist who thought he wanted to save the world by inventing this great medical device, it was probably easier to do that than in a shareholder, manage, shareholder value managed company of 2018. So there's a kind of interesting question that in some ways, we might even be doing less of that kind of intangible investment now than, yeah. than, than 50 years ago. Well, your reference to save the world, though, is a reminder that that's one of the big spillover effects of, of the iPhone, for example, or smartphones generally, as you know, the vehicles for delivering healthcare, for delivering education, for creating revenue generating opportunities in the developing world. I mean, the spillover effects are huge of these technologies. Um, le let me take you to some social issues, because obviously what's been very much on, on everyone's minds is the, is the growing gap in, uh, in, in, in income and in wealth, um, and the role of this economy in driving that. Um, so say a little, as a professor, Jonathan, say a little about what, what are the factors at play that are increasing inequality and are really exponentially? We, we, already, we already mentioned one of the dimensions of inequality earlier on, as Stian was saying, that the very successful firms are sort of streaking ahead and the laggards are being, you know, left behind. So, so one, with one the companies, yeah. So, so, so one dimension of inequality... Uh, is the inequality between the successful companies and the not quite so successful companies. Now, of course, that then spills over to a second dimension of inequality because the workers who are lucky enough to get employment at those very successful uh, economies are, 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 you know, are going to do particularly well. And particularly early on. Um, particularly early on, exactly. Uh, and, and then the sort of, again, the, the sort of nuance behind that is is to ask the question, you know, what are those types of workers, what, 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 what attributes do those workers have who are going to do particularly well? And one of the things we sort of talk about in the book is you might think that, you know, the career's advice from this book would be pretty straightforward, right? If there's lots of investment in R&D, you've got to be the best scientist. If there's lots of investment in software, you've got to be the best programmer. If there's lots of investment in design, you know, you've got to be the best designer. So you might think that that would be the kind of career's advice but for, for people to, yep. you know, if they're going to do well or do badly. Actually, one of the things we think, and it comes from the spillovers point that Stephen was just talking about, is that, of course, combining these things together is extraordinarily important. And a lot of success comes from the synergies we were talking about from the EpiPen. Mm -hmm. And so we think that one of the occupations which, which would do well is those types of people who are able to combine these things, who are able to marshal together, you know, all the disparate groups, uh, you know, in a modern firm who are firing off lots of great ideas, but it needs to be coordinated in a kind of a way. Um, so that's, an, that, that, that's a group of people who, who we think will do well, and hence leaders and managers, especially charismatic leaders, um, uh, probably have got those kind of attributes. So I read somewhere, I was mentioning this to you before, that mid-level managers will, will always be needed, Stian. I mean, there's no 
notion that there's just so much that automation can do, uh, it can't replace the mid-level managers. Does that strike you as right? I think it was McKenzie who said it. You're a former McKenzie guy, so you're you're on the line <laughs> so for this agree. one. I have to agree with them. I'll be deprogrammed otherwise. Um, the um, I think I think a lot. There there will continue to be a lot of mid-level jobs and a lot of what we think of as kind of office jobs or white collar jobs, and that does run contrary to our typical visions of the future, which think that a lot of jobs are going to be involved with you know, directly you know, programming robots or, or, or yeah. kind of other explicit tech jobs. But of course, one of the things about these intangibles is they're often pretty slippery concepts. So if we think about, say, the creative industries, there's a lot of business to be done in terms of who owns various copyrights, how does Spotify interact with the music industry to decide how contracts can be managed. And these things kind of look like kind of business people jobs. So I think weirdly, we in an economy that we think is becoming more and more high tech, a lot of these jobs where people sit at desks and do things that are pretty hard to explain to strangers will kind of will will those kind of jobs will probably increase in number rather than decrease. Yeah. So this this question card actually it, it, it uh, you, you you were beaten to the punch, audience, because this this question card asks about the about the future of work. Talk a little bit about the phenomenon of the sharing economy. Um, uh, it, there there are clear positives, but there are also some some questions about the relationship between um, the network of drivers, let's say, at Uber. Uh, and and uh, the management and whether the benefits are fairly shared. I don't. I, it, it's hard to think about a concept of fairness in in this. Yeah, but no, but say a little bit about the sharing economy. So I think this is a this is a really good question, and this is kind of a, the if we think about Uber's network of drivers, this is a great example of how these intangible assets are very contested. And they're not just contested who owns them, but it's even contested what people's rights should be. So if we think of supply chains and relationships with supply chain partners as an intangible asset. And clearly, a lot of Uber's value is instantiated in that relationship with, with, with its driver partners. The legal questions that Uber has faced in jurisdiction after jurisdiction are a great example of how we don't quite know what people's rights with regard to these intangibles should be. Should Uber be allowed to treat drivers as independent contractors. Yeah. And one of the stories that we tell about why these rules are less clear than the rules about ownership of tangible assets is simply that human beings have just had a lot longer to think about what it means to own a tangible asset. So if you go to a museum in Istanbul in Turkey, you can see there the oldest human law code which is from 2000 something BC. So, you know, this is a 4,000 year old object. And in that law code, they describe in very recognizable detail the ownership of lots of physical assets, fields and animals and houses and things like this. So human beings have owned physical things for as long as we've had written law at all. But the kind of earliest laws about intangible assets like copyrights and patents are from more or less kind of 1500 to 1700, depending on how you call it. So we've just had three and a half thousand years longer to get our heads around what it means to own a horse compared to <laughs> to own a kind of relationship with a supplier. And I think it takes societies a long time to work these things out. Yeah. Um, a, a, another questioner asked about uh, about portable benefits. And I realize this is a little off topic from your book, but um, in, in fact, that's part of the thinking with the sharing economy. Mm. If you're going to always be a contractor, what do you do about health insurance, pensions, et cetera? Do you have a point of view on portable benefits? And I, are they taking hold as a notion? No, I, I think it's one of the striking things coming from the UK where, you know, we have a public health service and all yeah. of that. Now we can debate public versus private, but, but, but it's essentially one's access to health in the UK does not depend upon the identity of your employer. Yeah. Right. It doesn't matter who well, for you whom you one. work, yeah. you know, or, or whether you have one, as you say. Yeah. And that's always rather curious, I think, for visitors to the U.S. Uh, to, to to show how, you know, locked in in some of these cases one is to one's current employer. Yeah. And maybe, you know, as the sharing economy comes along and those relationships dissolve more often, maybe that kind of thing has to be rethought a little bit. Yeah. But of course, this is now contested. I mean, uh, this uh, this. this the, the attitude toward Obamacare, sure. for example, or toward, toward health care 
financing here. Sure, sure. Oh, it's controversial in the UK as well. Please, I don't want to tell everybody uh, that the UK is the best way to do it at all. Well, I think I'll I'll always remember when when you last had the Olympics, um, the opening ceremonies featured the National Health Service. That's right. So I think think we have a sense of how important it is. uh, See, the the, the National Health Service is basically religion in the UK. You know, the the Church of England has sort of, well, (laughs) you know, gone through a bad time really in the last about seven centuries. So the National Health Service, that's our new religion, really. (laughs) (laughs) So we have a couple of questioners, uh, question cards regarding uh, new technologies. Mm -hmm. One asks whether emerging technologies like like, uh, artificial intelligence and blockchain are going to impact how intangibles are valued and how they might uh, grow in the future. So um, I think there's a really interesting angle um, around how new digital, digital technologies can affect this question of spillovers. So if we think back to the problem of spillovers, it's that problem of EMI invents the CT scanner, but they get no benefit from it. Now, if we think back to that example, what were the incentives there? Well, there were really strong incentives on Godfrey Hounsfield, the scientist who designed it, because as I said, he got a knighthood. He was a fellow of the Royal Society. He got a Nobel Prize. There were strong social and social rewards for him for generating all these positive spillovers. Now, you know, it's we can't recreate the highly stratified societies of the past, and um, you know, there's only so much you can do with kind of public honors. But it's kind of ma- I, it makes I, I get very interested in whether there are some ways that we can use digital technology to do that. I've certainly had it suggested to me there might be a blockchain application there. But equally, I kind of get very curious when I look at some of these social credit mechanisms that are now being rolled out in China. China, which obviously have all sorts of, throw up all sorts of moral and political science questions, but they are a way of recognizing kind of pro-social behavior. And it may be that if we have an economy where we want people to be very pro-social, where that's becoming more important because there are all these spillovers. Maybe I think you're like going to have to describe social cr- credit programs. So, so, oh, so, sure so my understanding of how this works, and this is at the level of having read newspaper articles about it, is that civic good behavior in China is rewarded with points, and those points get you civic entitlements, which is, um, you know, there's a, there is something slightly big brotherish about that. Um, but on the other hand, you could sort of see if you want a society where you suddenly think it's good to reward altruistic behavior. I mean, there are applications of this kind of thing being rolled out in places like Barcelona as well. So it's not, you don't need the Communist Party of China to run these things, <laughs> though other, other political systems are available. Can, can I just say a word on artificial intelligence, actually? Because yes. I, I think there is, if, if you'll forgive us from being so bold, an intangible kind of as, uh, angle to artificial intelligence, which is, one way it seems to me about thinking about artificial intelligence is that it's an extraordinary fusion of computer hardware running incredibly quickly, so that's a very tangible thing. But the intangible bits are the vast amounts of data which are now capable of being mined, number one. And number two, the smart software programs that can then run through all of this data and recognize cats and you know all, all, the, sort of, all, the, all, the, all the sort of things there. So I think one of the ways of thinking about artificial intelligence is it is indeed a bundle of intangible assets interacting, as I say, with a tangible asset like a fast computer. Yeah. You talked about, Stian, the, the fact that we've had a long time to get used to the notion of owning a horse and what that horse's value, what that horse's value is. Talk a little bit about how policy, whether policy has caught up with, with many of the issues that, that intangible investments raise, but also how, how you would recommend, or how we could make it catch up if it, if it hasn't yeah. in key ways. That's I'm a really good go question. go back to you, and Jonathan, on this as well. Um, I think, so, one obvious opportunity here for policymakers, if we're not seeing as much investment in intangibles as kind of would be ideal, if companies are not investing because they want to avoid the trap that EMI got into with the CT scanner, then there is a case for, over time, spending more public money on intangibles. And that sounds a very kind of abstract thing to say. But obviously, we do this in some ways a lot already because the public sector in almost every country funds a lot of Mm R&D through scientific research. 
But there are kind of other things that public sectors around the world fund by way of intangibles already. So, for example, government, pro government procurement is a famous way of encouraging innovation and investment. And, you know, the Internet was kind of founded through procurement by DARPA and semiconductors. The U.S. government had a huge role in, uh, in the development of that. But so potentially public procurement is one, is one option. And the other interesting thing is the question of if we're thinking about, for example, sharing, on, sharing economy platforms or data sets, there's an interesting public role there. If you go to Paris, there is an app called MyTaxi, which is basically a version of Uber run by the French, by the Paris city government, which is one way of addressing some of these questions. You publicly provide the intangible of that platform. Another option is public data sets. So the Census Bureau, uh, a lot of the mapping systems from around the world were kind of a 19th century publicly provided intangible. There's a kind of question in the future, are there other data sets that we might think it's a public good to provide and, and do that? So there's a big role for public investment here. Uh, as, as you remember, the Obama administration actually put a pretty heavy emphasis on, on uh, open data. Uh, including the data developed by, generated by governments, but also the, the data gathered yeah. uh, by, by the government on, on things like uh, employment in this country. Jonathan, are there other recommendations for yeah, ways to... Yeah, so, so just, just on the data, I mean, mm -hmm. there is one potentially quite massive source, uh, we were talking about the National Health Service uh, yeah. earlier on, which is that the National Health Service, being a national health service, is literally potentially an enormous data bank of the entire population of the UK. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if we think about, you know, a lot of diseases which would be amenable to the analysis of data and, uh, you, you know, to look at correlations with, you know, smoking and, you know, obesity and all those kinds of things, we actually have in the UK, potentially, we're sitting on a huge national data set, an intangible asset, uh, which could be, uh, you, you know, some very, a very valuable co contribution to medical scientists for, for figuring this stuff out. But of course, in order to do all of that, we need to figure out all the privacy concerns around all of that as well. A, yeah, so enormous ethical issues. It's a terrible ethical issue. It's a terribly difficult ethical issue as well. And I think for every parliamentarian in the UK who's pointed out the potential of this vast amount of data, other parliamentarians will point out the privacy issues there as well. And I think it goes back to you know what Stephen was saying earlier on, which is that we haven't managed to codify as a society quite quite yet you know, who owns these rather intangible notions of owning information and owning data. That's and, that's much more up in the air. And of course, well, don't we own it? For example, if, if, if Google is, is, is gathering data on us, uh, does Google own that data or do we own that data? Have we resolved that question? It's such an important question. And I think there is a kind of, there is something that really scares me in this question. So we feel, it sounds like we've acknowledged that there's this need to build new institutions to work out how we trade off these intangibles, whether it's data or whether it's research and so forth. So we need new institutions in the same way that we develop new institutions in the Industrial Revolution. But we kind of have a problem here. Because as we were saying, this intangible economy also creates inequality and it creates divides between the kind of the intangible haves, the kind of metropolitan elites and the left behind classes. So how do you build institutions in a world where there's more political strife, where populism is kind of undermining the basis for a lot of these norms? And um, if anyone has the answer to that, I would really like to hear it. You used the phrase in the book, I think it was esteem inequality. Mm. Describe what that means. Jonathan, I'm going to give that one to you because uh, you nodded more vigorously. <laughs> I think it's one of the other dimensions of inequality we mentioned before, the dimension mm -hmm. between the firms and then the dimension between various workers. Uh, and, it, and it is this. It's sort of trying to get at the notion that many voters in the UK, but also in the US, obviously, as well, feel somehow left behind. They feel somehow excluded from the kind of current of the economy, maybe the discussion of the political process. And that's exemplified in the UK by Brexit. It, exemplified in the US by who people vote for for president, for example. Now, uh, why? So you might just say, well, isn't that a sort of a deep cultural thing? And aren't there, you know, it's not really amenable to kind of economic explanation. So one of our feelings is that if part of 
uh, be, you know, succeeding in the intangible economy is interacting with others, having the kind of skills and talents that make you open to experience, you know, cooperative with other people, exchanging ideas and all that kind of thing. If those are the people who are going to succeed in the intangible economy, that leaves behind those people who don't have the educational background or don't have the various attributes to do that kind of thing. Often as well, since we're in San Francisco, many of the pe types of people who want to succeed in the intangible economy will move to places like San Francisco, or dare I say it, London as well, uh, because there they will pick up synergies from other people who are also doing designs, also doing computing, and all that kind of thing. So that puts a sort of an urban rural divide in place as well uh, uh, so that the so that you living in the cities living in the towns increasingly selects on the basis of these various attributes and that we think adds to the inequality of esteem mm. so that that brings me to a seemingly random question card that turns out not to be random oh. and that relates to housing prices oh That's a good a big question so Stian. <laughs> so We've been talking about these intangible assets you can't see and touch. And you'd think that a house is the absolute opposite of that, because you can see and touch a house. They're big things. Um, but one of the big paradoxes of the rise of the intangible economy is that one type of tangible asset, housing and property, becomes disproportionately important. And the reason for that, we talked about these synergies and spillovers from intangibles, the idea that it's really good to be in a position to bring ideas together to take Spotify and music rights or whatever and bring the, and, and, and merge them. And although people for about 30 years have been forecasting this thing called the death of distance, where it wouldn't matter where you were, you could just telecommute, it kind of hasn't really happened yet for the most part. And actually a lot of interaction still happens face to face, which is why there are clusters like San Francisco and Silicon Valley and places in London and so forth. So we have this kind of paradox that for the time being at least, until VR or Slack or whatever advances so that you can genuinely interact from anywhere, places, thriving places, kind of liberal metropolises, will become even more important, which again means that house prices in them will become more important. Now, you know, San Francisco is a city where house prices are a really big political issue. That's the case in London as well. One challenge is that in both cities, it's very hard to build anything. Mm. Um, I guess it's a perfectly legitimate democratic choice for society to make that we don't want to build a lot of stuff. or We want to preserve historic cities. But I guess one thing is that as the economy becomes more intangible, as the benefits to being in those cities increases, the cost of that choice, the cost of choosing not to build things will increase. We may choose that we, we may think that's okay, but it'll get more costly. I, I mentioned blockchain before, the underlying technology for various cryptocurrencies, but we have two question cards regarding cryptocurrency. And I think it's interesting because it, it speaks to the, the relationship with the government. This is a way to work around, around governments. So one asks how cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin uh, can affect the intangible economy. And another asks whether uh, cryptocurrencies could actually jeopardize the stability of our economy. I think that's a broader kind of economics-y question about the cryptocurrencies and whether, you know, it might, uh, you know, undermine central banks or produce more, um, you, you know, instability and speculative bubbles and all of that. I, I, I think for, for what we're trying to talk about, what's interesting is not so much the cryptocurrency and the Bitcoin and all of that, but it's the it's the kind of the ownership rights that mm -hmm. potentially the blockchain technologies we were discussing could, earlier can on document. Can, can, might be able to document. Yeah. And I don't think we've worked this out yet, but it might be that that is a way of, you know, entrenching ownership rights in a way that would be, turn out to be rather central to the right. intangible economy. And through, through it, we'll, we'll understand the provenance of something potentially. we buy. But I think what's perhaps even equally interesting in the developing world is that Blockchain can can help provide you a, a clear identity that will demonstrate your eligibility for government services, et cetera. So many of the poor don't have things like birth certificates. Um, in, in the State of the Union address, um, President Trump said, we're, we're a nation of builders. And my question is, are we? Uh, 
Uh, well, if you look at the official data, it'll tell you that buildings are being built and, you know, all that kind of thing, or except in San Francisco, of course, uh, but, you know, in, in, in various other places. So in that kind of narrow sense, um, yes, but, you know, what, what I think people who come from the UK really admire about the US is the spirit of entrepreneurialism and all that kind of thing. In terms of what our book is trying to talk about, mm -hmm. our feeling about that is that is building intangible capital. So it's building something very intangible, maybe not what the president had in mind. I don't, I, I, I don't know. Well, but it's certainly, book. it's certainly building we should, something. Well, yeah. he, he, <laughs> I don't know whether he's read our book yet. So, well, we uh, could, we there's could. an audio book version. There's, there's an, an audio, audio version. version, that's right. <laughs> so I'm going to say, well, I'm going to take you to some of it because it, Stian's already said that we, we haven't caught up in policy terms. I mean, that no one has. It's not, not particularly directed at the US. Um, but the, the trends we're seeing now are deregulation, particularly reduction in regulations that uh, may relate to consumer safety, uh, et cetera. He talked about how many more drug patents are, are going to be available. Um, is, is, this, is this a trend that makes sense in the context of what you've studied and what you've learned? So. This is the deregulation question is a tough one to answer because, on the one hand, there's some evidence that deregulation, whether of labor markets or of product markets, encourages investment in intangibles. So people have looked at investment by country and they've compared that to the amount of regulation. And the rationale for that, the reason why we think that happens, is because let's suppose you want to invest in a new business model with new software, new processes, some R&D perhaps, a whole bunch of intangibles. That is, we think, easier to do if it's easier to redeploy workers, if it's easier to bring new products to market because the regulations don't favor incumbents and so forth. So by that logic, deregulation is a good thing for the intangible economy. The flip side, though, is goes back to what we were saying before about institutions, that we need institutions for understanding what people's rights are with regard to, to intangibles. You want regulations so that people feel safe and feel confident in products. And yeah. at some point, one can deregulate so much that trust evaporates. It's something that we saw in Europe with genetically modified foods, something where there was a ton of R&D done, potentially huge, prom huge promise of this technology. But it was basically rejected en masse in Europe because we as Europeans didn't trust the technology. Um, and that, broadly speaking, came from a lack of the right kind of rules and the, the right regulation. Mm -hmm. Right. And, that, and the breakdown in trust could be really serious beyond. We, we've been talking about um, the scalability um, of businesses and of these, these, uh, these investments. That depends on open markets. Um, so how, how does this work relate, your own thinking relate, to the question of, of free trade and the, 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 the kinds of, of trade agreements we ought to be in? And how, how much should we open and connect our economies? Uh, well, we have a particular view on this in the UK because suppose in the UK you were thinking of isolating yourself from an enormously, hugely developed market mm -hmm. over which you might want to be scaling all these intangible assets. You might think in the intangible world that was a particularly mad thing to do. <laughs> so uh, this, is very, you know, this is very important for us in the UK. It's hard to tell what, whether you're passionate about this. I can, <laughs> I can see. Um, so, so as you're you're looking at at countries around the world, which which countries are are sticking with, uh, you know, how, how I just sort of want a comparative look. Who's still investing heavily in tangible assets, and who's more heavily in intangibles, and and why? What is the motivation? So, Stian, I'm going to direct that one to you. So. Um, We've looked in research that Jonathan and some of his collaborators has done in the past look, has looked at levels of intangibles in different countries. So the countries that are investing most in intangibles, the US, um, to some extent the Scandinavian countries, the Nordics, and the UK tend to be kind of leading the pack. Um, the other rich European economies, France and Germany, slightly lower down, um, and the kind of other European economies, southern European economies investing less. But they're growing, intangible investment is growing in all of those countries. And you see particularly dramatic growth in 
big emerging nations like China, like India, very rapid growth in uh, in intangibles in those countries. So the, some, the, the, the trend lines on the charts look pretty boring because they're broadly speaking going up in all mm -hmm. countries. One thing that we have seen though, which is also common to all countries, is that since the global financial crisis of 2009, there's been a dip. The growth rate has slowed down, still growing, but not growing as fast as before. And we think that speaks to still, you know, weaknesses in the financial system, the challenges of building these institutions to give people the confidence to invest in intangibles, and just the, the fact that it takes a long time for, for economies to really get back into their stride. So are, are you being called upon um, by governments, like the, for example, the British the government, to provide advice on how they should think about these issues. Uh, well, Stian should answer that since he, uh, you, you know, works, day job. <laughs> <laughs> works directly for the minister. But can, can I just give you a sort of somewhat academic answer just for a second? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, this is an area where I'm going to be, I'm going to proselytize economics a little bit here. Mm -hmm. um, professors of economics are often criticized for knowing absolutely nothing at all about the economy. Uh, but uh, once you get into this kind of area, then w one gratifyingly finds oneself in quite a lot of demand because mm -hmm. I think it's an area which uh, chimes a lot with a lot of policymakers uh, and chimed in particular with many politicians who, when they go around talking their, to their constituencies, uh, constituents and visiting businesses, and all of that, just see the intangible economy kind of blooming in front of their eyes. Mm -hmm. And this is your job, Stian. <laughs> so, so, so certainly from a UK point of view, um, the UK government has made some big commitments in the last couple of years to increase public investment in intangibles, particularly in research and development. Um, we've probably done a less good job at communicating that. It's sort mm -hmm. of not many people seem to know, but they've, we've, we've increased investment by a larger amount that has been increased in the last 40 years in the UK. So hopefully that will that will help bear some fruit. It's certainly something that we take very seriously. Um, I'm going to Toronto tomorrow, and I know the Canadian government um, has been focusing a lot on this since the change of government there as well. Um, and it's something that we, we, we hear about in a lot of places around the world, that mm -hmm. this kind of how you invest in the new economy is, is a priority. Some, some folks really will take a look at China and say, look, they're making the investments in artificial intelligence, they're making the investments in solar cells, we're slapping on tariffs. Uh, are, are we in the, going in the wrong direction? I think China, the story of investment in intangibles in China is really remarkable. When you see emerging Chinese companies, they're increasingly intangible-based companies. Um, and we know that you know the latest five-year plan in China has really ambitious targets mm -hmm. for becoming an innovation-based economy and so forth. I guess I don't know enough about Chinese political economy to know how much how much of that is is is, is centrally set versus how much is going on in businesses. Mm -hmm. But you know what I see as a layperson seems incredibly impressive and dynamic. Yeah. Did you want to add anything there, or I'm going to I'm going to return to a, a few question cards that didn't come together, they're, they're, they're sure. distinct. So one asks whether uh, the end of net neutrality in the US, would what, what would be the impact of the end of net neutrality in the US uh, to the inten on the intangible economy? I, I, I guess it depends upon how you think the end of net neutrality plays out in terms of encouraging investment in the network. Mm -hmm. um, because although it might discriminate between you know different prov providers, the people who are in favor of it, if they think it, it, it means some more network investment, that may be a good thing for the intangible economy on balance. I guess just to pick, pick up on the net neutrality question, yep. um, we've said that in an intangible economy, you'll get some really big and powerful companies. Um, traditionally, competition policy, and you know, I think of net neutrality questions as a bit of a subset of that. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, competition policy has said, big companies are really bad. We mustn't have big companies that are dominant in markets. But it may be an intangible era, in an intangible era, more big companies will, will be natural. But the really important thing, if we're in that kind of world, is to make sure that there's still rivalry, that there's still opportunities for small companies who have the right idea to grow mm -hmm. rapidly and challenge the big people. And I think that would be the question I would ask of net neutrality. Does, does that help or compromise yep. that? And as you think about these great big behemoth companies that, that we, we have here, one of the questioners asks whether there are EU-based companies in the pipeline that would really challenge a Google, a Facebook, an Apple, an Amazon, 
uh, th which is a question that the EU authorities keep asking themselves. You know, <laughs> they keep on saying, why was Google not started uh, in Europe? Well, Skype was started in Europe, I suppose, wasn't it? Nokia, you know, was, uh, was, uh, was previously a European thing. Look, part of this is, to the extent that this is, you know, rivalry, um, who knows where the competition might come from? It might be Chinese, uh, you know, might be next. So so Skype, Skype was bought by eBay. Where S is it now? It's now owned by Microsoft, I think. It's Microsoft, yes, right? but it's, it's Dutch. It's, yeah. It was a Dutch invention originally. Yeah. So, I mean, the interesting question about why is there no European Google is comes back to this question of the scalability of asset mm -hmm. of intangibles. The fact that you know you can grow this across a big market. Um, obviously, the US is the biggest and richest market in the world to scale uh, an innovation mm -hmm. across. Mm -hmm. Although Europe has a single market. The single market for digital products is definitely a work in progress. So if you do, if you are, say, Spotify, for example, an example of a European intangible-based company, it's harder to spread across Europe and take advantage of that scale than it is if you're a company based in Chicago to scale across the whole of your kind of very rich American market. So mm. that's, that's a challenge for us in Europe. So two other questions. One is, how can the privatized fine arts market and artists benefit from the spillover effect? Mm. I think you see that with technology that's applied in the art market. Um, Sorry, do you want to... You're thinking, about, you're thinking about artistic originals or... or, or is that, is that right, questioner? It, it was original works of art, right? Right. Yeah, okay. Well, I think... Um, S -s scalability is going to be one possibility, N -n namely the fact that although it might, uh, assuming one can get title to the types of uh, you know art that one is producing, the ability to scale that and for, for many many people to see it um, might greatly expand the market actually, uh, and may might make it easier for uh, uh, you know starting artists to you know get themselves established. So the, the final question is something you've started to answer, but it's from students, so I feel I should ask it nonetheless. And that is, what kinds of skills would you recommend a student to build in light of the development of the intangible economy? So the standard answer is always science, technology, engineering, math skills. That's the kind of standard answer for how to prepare for the future. But I think if we're going to be in this intangible economy where it's not just about coding, for example, but it's about bringing together different ideas. It's about bringing together artistic originals and software platforms. It's about bringing together branding and supply chains and so forth. Then some of the kind of more traditional liberal arts skills are going to be really important as well. Influencing skills, leadership skills, and social skills. They seem very old world, but I think they might only, it might, not just they won't go away, but they might actually become even more important. So I would kind of hold a, hold, I would put a bet in for liberal yeah, arts there. No, I think we hear more and more about the importance of liberal arts because the skill you really need is you need to learn how to learn because you're going to be perpetually learning new things. Um, please join me in thanking Jonathan Haskell and Stian Westlake. <laughs>